This is not the Jim Carrey you remember. The film gives us a taste of all the craziness we're about to witness. Yes, everything is connected to the number 23. February 3rd, let's meet our protagonist, Walter Sparrow. He works for animal control. Yes, he's already weird and it's gonna get weirder. You better pick up Unit 5. Before we get to that, time for a flashback. It's Christmas and you know what that means. No, it's party time. Unfortunately, Walter's wife, Agatha, is down with the sickness. Yeah, social distancing wasn't a thing yet. Agatha insists Walter goes to the party. He's got a cake to deliver. And deliver he did. This is the dispatcher, Sybil, who called him just before the flashback. I've got a better cake in the bitch's room. <laughs> I'm not going with you if you were the last bitch on earth. Apparently sexual harassment doesn't exist for men, so Sybil is still employed. Back to the present, and on his birthday of all days, she bullies Walter into a last minute dog hunt. A good boy greets Walter. His response? Discussing the long relationship of dogs in China. In China? They eat dog. That's offensive. Hello, Ned. Good boy. But even good boys bite. <laughs> Walter is already off duty, but he's dedicated to the job. He follows Ned to a graveyard. Hmm, someone you know? Meanwhile, Agatha, who is supposed to be meeting with Walter right about now, distracts herself with books. And to move the plot forward, the number 23 book appears. Destiny. If I had only cheated on my wife with Sybil, I wouldn't have been late because of the dog, and Agatha wouldn't have found this cursed book. Inside, Walter shows off his wound. This came courtesy of Ned, which probably stands for Nasty Evil Dog, and soon to be Nasty Evil Dead Dog. Buzzing. Anyway, they have some friends to meet. Agatha's. Why are we meeting your friends on my birthday? Probably because you don't have any. Relatable. Anyway, she has a gift for him. The number 23 by Topsy Kratz. Agatha has already somehow read it and insists Walter will like it. I'll wait for the movie. Buddy, do I got news for you. After, they arrive at Isaac's house. They're just friends, I swear. Walter's not feeling the party vibe, so he opens his present. This is a work of fiction. If you find any resemblance to any of the characters, you may be crazy. Later, Walter prepares to indulge in his other cake. Or not. Walter's a cool dad, so he covers for his son, Robin. He decides to try his hand at some outdoor fun instead. Here. Stop that. I like being an only child. Here's your birthday gift, dad. <laughs> Thanks. Nice girl, by the way. Back door. Whoa, Walter. Isn't he too young for that? Anyway, he continues reading and learns that the main character goes by the name, Fingerling. I couldn't have chosen a more spookier and mysterious name. Seriously, that's the name. I'm not sure if Walter got to eat his wife's cake as we cut to the next day. Walter goes through mandatory therapy. Is this your first bite? Animal one, yes. The wife gets rowdy at night. Yes, he actually said this. And as far as the dog? Can't blame a creature of lower intelligence for that. Just like how I let my wife choose the color of our living room walls. He also really said this. Walter gets the all clear, but not before answering what color the walls are. Red. Blood red. Wow. Subtle. Chapter 2. Imagine me if you must, someone you once knew. Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. Except Fingerling is a boy. A special one. I didn't want to be like my distant, sad accountant of a father. I came out when I was 8 years old. He came out as a detective, that is, to the delight of his mother. And 8 years is a ripe age for rebellion. He broke his father's rule. He went over the neighbor's fence while chasing their dog, Alfie. Alfie led Fingerling to his owner, Miss Dobkins, or what was left of her. An eight-year-old shouldn't see this. His mind went wild with thoughts of a serial killer on the prowl. It was ruled as a self-deletion, but from this, the detective was born, Detective Fingerling. Somehow, that sounds even more lame. Back in reality, Agatha catches a distraught Walter reading away before he drops some revelations. I'm the main character. I am Fingerling. We have the same book. And check it. Our neighbor had dogs. Well, that's shocking. <sighs> Walter even used to collect detective magazines. And most importantly, Miss Dobkins reminds him of his mom, who also quit the game of life when he was eight. His wife counters. Fingerling is nothing like you. Just wait till you get to the end. However, Walter's not convinced. Then, he proudly shows his son the book's selling point. Fabrizia. Boys will be boys. Walter's dramatic interpretation shows Agatha as a brunette. A kinky one will leave the rest of the imagination. In the middle of the night, Walter is greeted by a sleep paralysis shadow guy. Hate those. Anyway. Chapter 5. Today, Detective Fingerbutt meets the suicide blonde. I should mention, if you hadn't noticed, that all these blondes look like his mom. And they all meet the same fate. A permanent necklace. Fingerling hits her with the, No, don't kill yourself, you're so hot. And that's all it took. Then, she hands him some coffee as he notices her scars. I'm a bad person. I don't want to make you bad. Uh... Okay. 
Top tier dialogue, and we're just getting started. The craziness is about to begin. It's this number. 23. It rules my world. This scene happens at the 26 minute mark. Missed opportunity. Anyway, the blonde has major daddy issues. He called it a curse, and now it haunts his daughter. The blonde sees 23 everywhere. Pink is my favorite color. Do you know what pink is? Red, 27, white, 65, 65 is 27, 92. What the fu- Okay. Fingerling keeps her talking to prevent you know what. Now that he has her in a good mood, his work here is done. Oh. She begs me to take her to the apartment. Her reaction is pure Fabrizia. Great work, Jim. You're killing these lines. As the pages fell from the walls, Fingerling unraveled the depths of the blonde's obsession. Everything is connected to 23. Even her full name adds up to the number. Somehow. I, I don't know. Walter is swayed by the book. He starts seeing 23 everywhere. The 23 Enigma. E? Enigma? Wait a minute. Anyway, he decides to investigate. This book is entirely self-made. Props to you for supporting indie creators. Ooh, the number. This doesn't help Walter, so he retreats home. And he's gone full-blown crazy already. Writing on the walls and shit. You guessed it. Everything about him adds up to 23. Everything. It's like it's imitating my life. Somehow everyone is still all smiles about his craziness. Agatha shuts her husband down. Fingerling becomes a killer. How many people have you killed? Oh, just you wait, Agatha. Walter ain't going down without a fight. It's even the color of our walls. Red number five. R-E-D is 27 plus five is 32, which is... Stupid. This is all stupid. But Walter continues. Fingerling met Febreze when he was 32, and he met Agatha when he was 23. The reverse. Uno. Wow. Even his son gets involved, pointing out their address. 1814. You do the math. Pro tip. It can result in any number if you try hard enough. Walter makes it to chapter seven. Fabrizia's adventurous ways are escalating. Pretend you have a knife. Ooh, I have a knife. I'm gonna stab you. <laughs> I loved her, and I thought she liked me. Not really, though. Relatable. It's February 6th. In just three days, 23 has consumed Walter's life. Agatha should be seriously concerned. That's not a normal note. Trash the book, lady. Instead, she calls for Isaac's help. The consultation is set in a university. Isaac seems more entertained than concerned. He calls it 23's game of paranoia. He feeds Walter with some interesting 23 facts. The Earth spins in an axis of 23.5 degrees. The 5 is simply 2 plus 3. Euclid's geometry, chromosomes, blood circulation, the end of the world, 2012, 20 plus 12, or 20 plus 1 plus 2, 2 divided by 3 is 0.666, the devil's number. How is this helping Walter's madness? Isaac simplifies it as, We're looking for 23, so you're finding it. Finish the book, and if you're crazy, we'll put you in Arkham Asylum. Then, I'll bang Agatha, and I can finally hunt Wolverine. We cut back to Fingerling's Fabricia session. Only this time, he couldn't keep silent with his 23 obsession. You have 23 pairs of shoes. <sighs> Fingerling's nightmares don't stop, so he consults a shrink. That's right, Dr. Miles Phoenix overlaps with Isaac. Maybe I should be a fucking accountant. <laughs> the doctor forces the detective to go on emotional leave. No guns, which makes our kinky friend unhappy. I can't be with a man who doesn't honor the Second Amendment. Alrighty then. Sometime later. What are these shoes doing in the trash? You have 23 of them. Let's pretend that Fingerling's tantrum is caused by the number and not the color of his balls. You get it because she blue balled him earlier? <laughs> the detective has gone off the deep end, listing off historical facts that all happened in some way on the 23rd of something or whatever, I don't know. It's all 23. The number got the suicide blonde, and now it's after Fingerling. I can talk to your girl for you. I'm not gonna bang her, you can trust me. He just wanted to sample her chapstick, don't worry. Uh oh, jealousy is an awful monster. Not only is he consumed by the book, but he's reading into Isaac's words too much. Walter's thoughts bring him to Agatha's shop. Uh oh, they're just talking, they're just friends. Walter returns to Fingerling's story, bringing us to a fun outdoor excursion. The detective is understandably upset, betrayed by the love of his life. Then, Walter awakens to find his sanity degrading further. He heads downstairs for a refreshing glass of water, but finds his hand stained red instead. Oh no, this must mean... Maybe it's that time of the month. Oh god, no! No, it was a nightmare. Agatha is alive. Ah oh. oh, shit. Walter's paranoia makes him leave. He leaves a note behind. I'm just going out to grab some milk. I'll be back. <laughs> Walter ends up in a hotel and deliberately asks for, you guessed it. When he asks for the room, this strange man looks at him. Sauce. Chapter 22. Dr. Phoenix excitedly grabs a knife off the floor, expecting a warm welcome, only to find a cold Fabricia. Her body lays there while bloody Fingerling stalks them in the dark. The doctor's apprehended, but the main culprit escapes. Afterwards, Fingerling paces around his room clutching his saxophone, as one does. He heads out the window, and then... the end. Was that really the ending? 
a book dedicated to the number three without a 23rd chapter? The number went after Fingerling, now it's after Walter. Time for another dog hunt. Ned brings Walter to Laura Tollinson's gravestone again. Finally. Oh, and yeah, Ned equals 23 too, I, I guess. He belongs to their gardener. He's a rescue. This good boy likes watching over the stones, earning him the nickname Guardian of the Dead. Right now, Laura Tollins is his favorite. And that's right, she died when she was 23. But they never found the body. Spooky. Walter goes home, warning his family of the book's influence. Awkward, Isaac is here. Walter takes the opportunity to explain his findings to everyone. Laura Tollins was a college girl murdered in her own bed. Kyle Flinch was found guilty when his prints were found on the murder weapon. Kyle was Laura's psychology professor and their extracurricular activities were exactly like in the book. Laura wanted to roleplay a knife attack just like Febreze. Kyle Flinch is top secrets. The book may very well be his confession. Isaac is acting all smug while a book is breaking his family apart. Robin is on Walter's side at least. February 8th. Walter comes face to face with the men responsible for the rabbit hole he's in. Naturally, Kyle denies killing Laura. She was taken from him. Walter doesn't care. He wants to know the truth. The book. The number. Why did you kill her? What happened to you? Prison's been difficult for Kyle. Over time, his family visits became less and less frequent. His sister eventually stopped coming, then his mother. Your dad may have left for milk, but mine, he saw me one last time to tell me my sister self-deleted. Couldn't handle a murderer for a brother. I loved Laura. I didn't kill her. I was clapping that ass like crazy. I'm innocent. Anyway, who would write a book and call themselves Top Secrets? My god. Top Secrets. Top Secrets. Are you kidding me? Oh my god. This whole time, Walter leaves, convinced that Kyle is innocent. After all, it doesn't add up. Literally. Agatha might be losing patience, but here's Robin to the rescue. He's well versed in the art of sticky pages and found a P.O. box embedded within one. How convenient. Naturally, they send 23 huge empty boxes to the location. Back home, husband and wife snuggle. I dreamt of stabbing you, and not in the fun way. The next day, they track down their parcels and wait for the author. Yeah, this guy looks suspicious. Game's over, top secrets. The old man attacks, but misses. He flees, but Walter is too good at catching dirty dogs. The old man brings the truth of the book to the grave. Walter panics, but Agatha insists she'll take care of everything. Just take Robin home. In the end, the old man hands in all he knows. He tells her to check out the Institute and Agatha snags his ID. Later, she phones home and withholds all information from her very curious husband. Agatha dives headfirst into the craziness and visits Nathaniel's Institute. The old man was Dr. Sirius Leary and he worked there. With his wife away, Walter searches the book for more answers. He's uncovered a hidden message after circling every 23rd word Robin! to the Batmobile. I'm sorry. The message reads, visit Casanova's Park, dig below the steps to heaven. Meanwhile, Agatha discovers Sirius's office inside the Institute. A little more digging and she discovers the doctor's own obsession with the number 23. Why do they all write on the walls? And this one wrote 23 on a candle. What? Anyway, Agatha finds a case file under Sparrow W. Walter. Suddenly, who's this? <gasps> suspense has the suspense. So we're back with father and son's trip to the park. Walter counts to 23, then they start digging. Well, it's not gold. Also, looks like someone's watching them. But that's okay. Their main concern is to report their findings to the authorities. Unfortunately, it's empty. I could have sworn we found a whole ass skeleton. It takes them until morning to follow a report. Typical. At least Agatha's here. With Isaac. Strange. On their way home, Walter spots Ned and has a go at him. Top speed. Nasty, evil, dead dog. Thankfully, he decides not to traumatize his family. Uh-oh, someone's been a dirty girl. At home, Agatha washes away the evidence. You. It was you. Her maiden name? Pink. That was the blonde's favorite color. He pieced it together all their previous conversations. Someday I'm gonna write a book. He may not even be a man. You're Topsy Kratz. Why'd you do this? Agatha's denial confuses her husband. Welp. She insists it's for her protection, but Walter believes she used it to silence the dying old man. Robin walks in as things escalate. Isaac and I took the skeleton. But I did not write the book. Walter is not easily persuaded. He's convinced Agatha's been lying the 13 years they've been together. So who wrote the book? You wrote the book, Walter. No, this can't be. They head to the basement where Agatha reveals everything she found. Inside is the book's manuscript, with Walter's name as the author. He still accuses his wife of faking the entire thing. Isaac's sudden entry doesn't help. Walter has convinced himself these two conspired with one another, but suddenly memories come flooding in. He digs into his file and finds the comic books he collected. They're all a part of him. He was the author. Disturbing. He runs off, still in denial, as more of his memories return. Walter makes his way to his hotel room, catching more glimpses into his past. This very hotel room is where he spent his days writing the book. Chapter 23? It's on the walls. You can call me Fingerling, but my real name is Walter. Walter Paul Sparrow. He's been contemplating suicide. 
It ran in the family. His mother's death immediately followed by his father's. Sad to say, the only inheritance was the number 23, something his dad was obsessed with. Laura? They met in college. The tattoos were fake and so were the detective stories, but the wild knife rides weren't. And unfortunately for him, Laura also played with her professor, Kyle Flinch. Eventually, she dumps him. After encircling every 23rd letter on her breakup note, he comes up with, kill her. Yes, he's insane. Laura, the number is after you. You need to leave. She tries protecting herself, then... You think you have the guts to use it? I don't. You're pathetic like your father. <laughs> this time, they aren't role-playing. Later, Walter buried the body and the professor ends up taking the fall. Walter then takes residence in the hotel, room number 23. Oh, and this is the guy that was watching TV earlier. Inside the room, Walter wrote his suicide note, but it became something more. Much, much more. When he ran out of paper, he used the walls. And that's how you overcome writer's block. Overwhelmed by guilt, he takes his final action. The manuscript is finished, but the author isn't. He survived. He lost his memories and all his writings were considered fiction. Dr. Leary was in charge of his case, concluding it as Severe graphomania, the survivor's guilt mixed up with a numerology obsession. He passed on the case, he ends up keeping Walter's book, and we know the rest. Walter has blocked out the entire movie from his brain, and I suggest we do the same. Although, he succeeds in his rehabilitation. If I never see you again, I hope not. And to cut things short, Agatha makes her appearance. Walter eventually moved on from the number, but not this guy. Dr. Leary became obsessed and fell to the number's curse. Back in the present, Agatha finds her husband. You weren't a bad person. You got better. You were a sick person who became well. I don't know the difference, and neither does Walter. I killed Laura. An innocent person is in prison. I can't let him suffer. Walter runs outside and gives up, ready to quit. Destiny awaits. There's no such thing as destiny. And just like that, it's all over now. The curse has been lifted. Walter eventually turns himself in, freeing Kyle and laying Laura to rest. Justice has prevailed and their family still together through it all. It's all over. Maybe it's not the happiest of endings, but it's the right one. Wait a minute. Shit. Moral of the story? 69 is a way cooler number.